Hi everyone, here is Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Club. And uh, as usual, we are here at the Kunstquartier Betanien for the conference of the Disruption Network Club. This is our conference number 32. And uh, I'm also very proud to say that this conference signs uh, uh, the beginning of our jubileum. So this year, actually, we celebrate 10 years of the Disruption Network Club. And we are going to do a big conference uh, end of November, in which we will do something bigger related to this anniversary. And uh, I really want to thank uh, the team of the Disruption Network Club, uh, all the people that have been working with me for the past 10 years, because uh, I think it's also thanks to all of them that uh, we reached this moment. Uh, and so I will also ask uh, all of you here to do a big applause to the team of the Disruption Lab in 10 years. <laughs> and uh, this conference uh, is under the title Beyond Control resisting digital oppression and authoritarianism. Um, it's very important to be able to speak about these topics today, especially because this is our duty as people that are working with culture and art, and also they try to speak out when we have to expose a system of wrongdoing and even war crimes. The Disruption Network Lab, we have been working for 10 years also with whistleblowers, especially with uh, war whistleblowers. Uh, and uh, it's very important that we keep doing our work, uh, even if uh, we are becoming more and more in a difficult situation, even to be able to speak. And uh, this conference uh, uh, relates to the discourse of uh, digital authoritarianism, uh, that is, uh, an interesting concept that was initially suggested me by the team of Global Voices, that I also want to thank a lot. Um, and uh, is interesting because it uh, encompasses two very important aspects. Uh, one aspect uh, is related to um, the discourse of information warfare and the fact that uh, the digital tools could also be used to target people, especially minority, and uh, oppress people that have a different kind of opinion and also are trying to work for activism and social justice. And at the same time, we also know that uh, uh, digital authoritarianism connects with the discourse of misinformation and also the discourse of uh, uh, propaganda that often happens in conflicts and in wars. So these uh, events uh, brings together these two aspects uh, from one side to try to fight and focus and understand uh, uh, hate online and trying to understand also how we can respond to it uh, in a positive way by also making uh, our rights uh, go ahead. And uh, at the second time, the second aspect is that we want to focus also on strategies uh, to circumvent uh, uh, restricted access to communication and also targeting uh, of uh, people that express their dissent, uh, even journalists or activists, or people at risk. And so this is something that we will also um, focus on the panel today. Um, first of all, so I want to say that uh, despite we are speaking about very difficult topics, what we are trying to do at the Disruption Lab is also to empower each other. And because of that, I really want to thank our audience 
both uh, online and also here in Berlin, because uh, I can say that for these uh, past 10 years, uh, Many people have been coming here, you have been always present, and we have been discussing these uh, uh, difficult uh, topics together, trying to empower each other. And I hope that we will keep doing also today and in the next uh, conferences to come. So I also want to welcome our audience uh, online, and I want to remind uh, that we are on streaming as well. Um, I want to thank uh, Ranav Adhikari and the Boiling Head Media for their fantastic work all the time with our streaming, and uh, tell the people that are following uh, remotely that we have a chat. So you can use the chat as well to ask questions to our speakers. Uh, you can do during the panels. Uh, we have our great uh, moderator or Agnese Trocchi that is uh, getting your questions and then we can ask the question directly to the panelists. So just uh, remember that. And uh, the program of today uh, consists of the keynote and the panel. Uh, the keynote will start immediately after my introduction and uh, I'm very glad uh, to have with us uh, Jihad van Painbroek that will tell her story to justice to us. And uh, the panel is entitled Unveiling the Depth of Online Racism. And uh, she is uh, one of the civil parties in the lawsuit against Schild and Frenden, that is a Flemish far-right youth movement so that attacked her online. She won her case, and uh, she will tell her story today to us. And the second panel instead focus uh, on the discourse of Gaza, Ukraine, and Azerbaijan, and the subtitle is Challenging uh, Network Authoritarianism. Uh, we will focus indeed uh, in, of this, on the situation of Gaza, on Ukraine and Azerbaijan, and also understand how we can uh, circumvent restrict access to digital infrastructure, and at the same time also understand uh, how despite all the very tough situation at the moment, we can also speak about uh, empowering our action and what can we do also in terms of uh, activism, of network, uh, of trust, uh, to deal with the discourse of war and uh, the oppression that our people, the people are suffering right now. Then we have two workshops uh, on Sunday, uh, one with Irma Mastenbrook, that is about uh, community girl blocking to save the internet. And uh, it's very nice that uh, she's creating uh, this idea of the girl blogging, uh, uh, really asking people to code with HTML and CSS to also by bypass the control of the big tech uh, and try to restore community among each other. There are still uh, spots available, so if you want to understand also how you create your blog uh, playing uh, uh, with codes, uh, but also not only with code, and also there's also a lot of crafting going around, then uh, you can uh, still subscribe. And then the second workshop is also really close to our heart, is about uh, WikiLeaks. And uh, you will see over there, we have uh, a table from uh, Berlin Support Assange. You can also, you know, support their work uh, uh, buying uh, uh, T-shirts uh, and the publication that they have. And most of all, also being with them every Friday at the Brandenburger Tour, where they are there since two years uh, to advocate for Julian Assange. And uh, um, this workshop is also very important because we know there is a lot of misinformation around the case of Julian Assange. We need to reclaim agency to press freedom and also make more clarity. Uh, so we will have uh, Raya Stutz and Claudia Desking that uh, will be running the workshop. This will be in the afternoon on Sunday and you can also subscribe still there. And uh, I would like uh, to uh, thank thanks our funders before we enter into the depths of the conference today. First of all, the Hauptstadt Kultur Funds, that is the Capital Culture Funds. Then the Riva and David Logan Foundation. We are also part of the New Perspective for Action, that is a project by Reimagine Europe, co-funded by the European Union. We work uh, in cooperation with the Wow Holland Foundation 
and in collaboration with Global Voices. Also a big thank to our partner venue, Kunst and Kreuzberg Betanien, and also NGBK. Uh, from this year, we will start uh, our cooperation with NGBK, that now they moved uh, to another venue, close to Alexanderplatz, and we will run our community program there. So very happy to say, and also the first event will be the 25th of April. I will announce this at the end of today. And also thank you to our media partner, Taz, host writer, and Il Mitte, and again, our streaming partner, Boiling Head Media. We also have member uh, programs since uh, now some time. So if you want to become a member of the Disruption Network Club with 50 euro, you get uh, for free to all our events. So it's a pretty good deal. <laughs> we have already some members. You are welcome to join. And also, uh, for the first time this year, we have a possibility of uh, donations that will be matched. This also thanks to the Riva and David Logan Foundation. Uh, if you give a donation up to 1,000 euro, this will be matched. So you will be able to make us give the double. So this is important to know if you want support more consistently what we do. And now I am very glad to announce our keynote. And uh, first of all, I will uh, introduce the wonderful moderator that uh, we have today. And uh, she will then uh, introduce uh, Giad van Pembroek that uh, is, uh, will start uh, the program with uh, her speech. Um, so I am very happy to call on stage uh, with me Nima Jadama. And uh, while she comes, I will also explain you who is, and I'm very proud that she is with us today. Nima, you can come here. So uh, Nima Jadama is an award-winning TV host, a media trainer from The Gambia. She hosts uh, Nima's Bantaba and uh, Unfiltered podcast, uh, connecting migrants, refugees, women and diaspora group worldwide on critical issues such as migration, integration, women's empowerment and cultural diversity. Nima founded the Bantam Academy for Migrants and Refugees and has received several awards for her activism and media advocacy, including the 2023 Silvio Mayer Prize from the Friedrichshain Kreuzberg district of Berlin. She was the first refugee advisor to the German government at the high level official meeting in Geneva in 2021. So, Nima, thank you so much for being here. Now I leave the stage to you. Thank you very much, Tatiana, for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this conference, um, Beyond Control. Tatiana has already explained about the conference. Um, welcome to the panel, Unveiling Online Depths of, uh, Unveiling Depths on Online Racism. Um, as you said, my name is Nima Jodama, and I am um, pleased to actually um, host this panel discussion with Jihad. We are actually gathered here today to confront the specter of digital authoritarianism and champion the cause of empowerment in the face of oppression. Today, we actually have the honor to set light on a story that optimizes the struggle against digital tyranny, a story that resonates not only in Belgium, but across the globe. The conf um, I am deeply privileged to introduce Jihad, um, Poimbrook, I hope I pronounced your name right. Jihad is actually a courageous activist whose journey stands as a testament to the resilience of human spirit in the face of relentless digital persecution. Jihad's story, though um, still not widely known, as I said, but it serves as a stark reminder on the indicious reach of digital authoritarianism and the profound impact it can have on individuals and communities. Jihad's unwavering commitment to anti-racism and social justice made her a target of vicious smear campaign orchestrated through online digital platforms. Her advocacy for the right of Muslim communities and her support for Palestine made her a lightning road for hate and vitriol. 
Yet, in the face of such adversity, she stood firm, refusing to be silenced by the fear of intimidation. The journey towards justice, though long and arduous. For years, Jihad endured relentless harassment and defamation, orchestrated through online channels founded by a former parliamentarian, Van Lagenhoof. But her resilience coupled with tireless efforts of journalists and activists eventually led to the exposure of the truth. A truth that laid the bare depths of digital manipulations and abuse. Jihad's story began with an online attack mounted, like I said, by a former parliamentarian who also founded and led a Flemish national youth movement called Schild and Vrienden. He was later sentenced to one year in prison for inciting violence, spreading racism, memes targeting activists from Muslim communities like Jihad, and of course, denying the Holocaust. The sentence was announced last year by the Genf court in Belgium, last, last month, March, sorry. Today, as we gathered here to amplify Jihad's voice and her struggle, and as well, we want to honor your courage, I mean, your courageous stance, let us forget let us not forget, rather, the broader implications, broader implications of her story. Let us recognize that her struggle is not isolated, but emblematic of larger battles against digital authoritarianism. A battle that requires all our collective resolve and solidarity. Um, we will soon start the panel. And during the panel discussion, you will learn a lot. I would learn myself a lot as I was reading through her story, watching the video, how the whole story initiated. With her presentation, you will know more. But during the discussion after her presentation, we would also delve deep into the mechanisms of digital oppressions, detecting the ways in which it manifests in different contexts, for civilian states to algorithm basis. We will confront the stark realities of digital control and its profound impact on individuals and communities around the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Jihad on stage for her keynote presentation. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, also, thank you for the invitation. Um, today I will give a keynote about my story personally. I gave it a little bit of a clickbait title, sorry for that. But uh, unveiling the depths of online racism and my story towards uh, justice. One of the things that I'm going to talk about is yeah, who is Schild and Vrienden, eh? uh, Schild uh, and Friends. Who am I? Yeah, why uh, am I being targeted uh, by this group? Um, why I became a civil party? Uh, the difficulties also of uh, this. Uh the difficulties also of this uh, uh, law, uh, law court system and my strategy and the lesson learned that I had uh, the couple of uh, years. So who is Schild en Vrienden? Uh, this far right uh, movement. This here is a picture of uh, Schild en Vrienden. In front you have Dries van Langenhoven, the, the leader of this movement. Schild en Vrienden, I'm just going to start with the first uh, fragment, a documentary, where you can get a little bit more information of Schild en Vrienden. So like I said, who is uh, Schild en Vrienden really? Uh, at, the, at the outside, they show themselves as a very... Um, uh, collective group youngsters who collecting dirt on the streets and who want to uh, identify the Flemish identity because it's a it's a Flemish uh, movement, but VRT uh, VRT is a, a Flemish public broadcasts reveals the racism and sexism in uh, this heart, in this uh, uh, right wing group. So they had um, uh, uh, an anonymous Discord group 
where they found, uh, yeah, where they uh, infiltrated in this online Discord group, and they found secret activities. Uh, they found how uh, they want to show at the outside world a misleading image of themselves. Uh, you can see also at the, at the pictures they are always wearing a costume, very like polite uh, youngsters, but in reality it was not uh, that. Uh, they, if you look deeper into this uh, anonymous Discord group, uh, you also said uh, you also saw in the documentary the pictures and the memes they. Will they made uh, it was an anonymous uh, Discord group. You discover a close network where racism and sexism is very alive um, in these uh, groups, uh, and they uncovered the racist, sexist, and also anti-Semitic face of this right-wing group. But at the first time, it was just shown as a, a movement, and then after this uh, documentary uh, came uh, on television, it was very shocking to see the the real face uh, of that group. So in 2018, eh, the, the, this, this documentary came on television uh, because VRT infiltrated in this uh, Discord groups. And um, they, after that documentary, they launched an investigation. It was in 2018, and the investigation lasted until 2022 because um, there was a lot of information to, to, to dig in and to discover what they were really talking about. So they investigated more than 17,000 messages to see what is happening in those Discord group? It's not only about memes uh, or freedom of speech. What is really going on in these Discord groups, and what is very um, violence uh, to the outside world? And of the 70,000 messages, there were like most, mostly 6,000 messages uh, um, were analyzed uh, linguistically then as racist, sexist, and verbally aggressive, according uh, to this analyze. It was the start of a six, six years long lawsuit because it was then just this year that he got convicted. As, so I'm not giving you like uh, the whole story and then the end, the result. But at the end, he got convicted. But it took a long way also for me to have this uh, very positive end result. So who is Dries van Langenhove? He is the leader of that group. He's also involved in international far-right network. So maybe uh, if you see German far-right groups, he can also be there uh, as a, one of the voices. Um, but he is the leader of the right-wing group and also about the linguistic analysis, they show that he was the leader and he also uh, uh, instigated that his members of his group, uh, they were like with 500 members, made those memes dicked in into the, uh, uh, the, yeah, the, the private private life of people to destroy them. So he was the one also in the, in the investigation, they say we associated a lot of things that comes by him and he took the crown within these uh, messages. Dries Falangenov always denied it until now. So he got convicted, but he still, uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's very known with far right uh, people or movements or political parties. They still deny, he still denied it. And he also got confronted uh, with these memes. And I'm going to show you a fragment of this. Yeah, so it's. Uh um, my apologies that I didn't give a disclaimer because they are very shocking images also. Um, yeah, where is it going? You can see the full documentary is still online. Eh? It's a very, very, uh, it's a documentary of one hour when they go in depth. Uh, we will uh, share the link afterwards. Um, but it's from the Flemish public broadcast. But you can see he, he, when he got confronted in 2018, he still denied it, but all the proof was already uh, there. And uh, after the investigation in 2018, he got charged and uh, with four uh, prosections. The first one is yeah, uh, uh, discrimination, segregation, uh, haters and violence on racism and xenophobia. The second one is spreading ideas based on, on hater and racial hatred. The third one is yeah, approving the genocide uh, during World War II and anti-negationism law. And the last one also the violation of the weapon laws because he's always, he had also a website where he sells pepper spray and like you see in the pictures, uh, things for boxing and so on. So these were the charges uh, they uh, made, uh, the prosecution made those charges. And then uh, the law uh, suit started, but in 2018, I have to stand there. 
Uh, where is Skilled and Vrienden now? Eh? It's very ironically, but maybe also uh, not uh, shocking in the, in the climate we are living right now, and also in Belgium. In 2019, so one year after this documentary, he became a parliament member uh, at Vlaams Belang. So Vlaams Belang is a far-right movement uh, in uh, Flanders, uh, so the Fl uh, Flemish-speaking uh, part of Belgium, where he became an independent parliament uh, at this... Uh, at, um, at the parliament at Flaams Belang. And uh, uh, in Belgium, you have a law when you become a, par a, a member of the parliament, you have a parliament immunity. I don't know how it's in uh, Germany, but his uh, parliament immunity has to be lifted. It's very important to have also this context because it became not only a lawsuit uh, for justice, but also very a political lawsuit, uh, especially for civil society uh, and civil, civil society organizations. It was very important to get him prosecuted. Um, yeah, and who am I? Um, what am I doing in this Schild en Vrienden uh, story and uh, saga? Um, I tried to give a summary why I, I uh, was attacked by Schild en Vrienden. So here you have like a little pictures of me. At, I was 16, 17 years old when I started activism. So uh, I started organizing pal uh, pro-Palestinian manifestations. I was very... Um, in the public opinion, giving my voice as a young, a young girl who wants to give her voice around the topic of racism, discrimination. Um, I also was a member of the Youth Flemish Council, so I had a lot of conversations with ministers, political parties, so I give uh, policy advice as a youngster uh, on, around these topics. Um, and I also did an internship at the parliament, at the left a green a party where I was studying political communication. I started an internship um, just to know more about how political uh, politics works. So I did an internship and I was also, uh, I, I'm still uh, someone who uh, talks, uh, gives keynotes uh, on the topics of discrimination, anti-racism, equality. And also something interesting, it's in, it's in Dutch, uh, my apology, but I will translate it. Here I was, uh, you can also see on the profile picture, I was very young. I was 16 years old when an advice came out of the Flemish Youth Council about uh, refugees. And I tagged the minister of then, uh, the, the, the minister of asylum, um, uh, the Minister of Asylum uh, and uh, about refugees, and I tweeted and tagged him, and I said, "This is an uh, this is an advice for you, read it." And he was um, a minister of the right, uh, conservative uh, political party, and he tweeted back, and he said, "Yeah, you are a member of the Flemish Youth Council, but you are tweeting under the name Jihad, like he was assuming that it was not my real name." Um, and that became a big uh, thing also in the media. So I was just finishing my exam. I was sleeping and then my phone blew up because uh, how does this minister attacking a young girl just because it's her name? He was not known of it. He was not aware of it. So also in the media, they talked a lot about my name, uh, where it came from. Um, so from then, I was already seen by Schild en Vrienden. So it's very interesting to see. I am telling this, some things I knew after the investigation, some things I saw, but I was not sure what is really happening, eh? what is really going on. So why did I become a civil party then? Um, here we have, uh, how, how did it all start? How does this, because I became a civil party, uh, because I started an online hate orchestrated campaign against me. So in 2018, I became, uh, started to work at the Flemish public broadcast, and I don't know how it's here in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Germany, but the VRT is very like a big thing if you work there. There are a, a, big, a big media company, of course, but they are the Flemish public broadcast. They get money from the uh, government. So ne being neutral, being objective is very important. But I was already an activist, giving my voice, my public opinion, and I had also a lot of critic to the media, but I was like, I'm giving a lot of critic to the media, let's work in the media to see how it really works. So at 2018, I started to work, I got a job, and I mentioned it on Twitter, very proud, hey, I'm working now at VRT News as a social media manager, hit me up if you have some news, or so on. So I, I posted it on Twitter, and then Dries Valangenhoven at that time retweeted it and said, hey, from now on, the news will be made by 
jihad. He, de- he, uh, he uh, didn't mention my last name. It was on purpose. And it's someone who in the past didn't acknowledge the Flemish culture. So very interesting to see he used, a re- uh, he used something that I knew already. I had a conversation with him or a reaction on uh, Facebook pages. I don't know where it was. With other members of Schild en Vrienden where I actually uh, said, what is the Flemish culture actually? I just uh, did ask the question and he used it to say, she said that the Flemish culture don't exist. Then on their page, publicly, on their Facebook page, they made a post about me saying, yeah, she is going to work for VRT News. From now on, the news will be made by her. And actually just giving my LinkedIn page, everything they knew, I was working at an internship, I was an activist, and so on and so on. Everything you can find publicly, they used it, but you can see how they framed it. It's not on purpose. They, will, they used a picture with next to me, a friend with a hijab on. And on the right side, you can find the minister, and then she was the minister of work. So they use it to give it more a frame of VRT VRT News will not be neutral anymore, get her fired. And it wasn't just that. It wasn't just that. Um, That was publicly, but they also um, managed to dig in into my past. So what did they do? They were looking at my tweets and were looking Palestine. Jews, Israel, yes, we found it, she's anti-Semitic, she, uh, she, uh, if you found that, if you found something about Palestine, you're anti-Semitic, so they made a collage of all my tweets, and it was tweets when I was 15 or 16 years old, and they said, look at this, look at this woman, um, she is now working at VRT News, she is anti-Semitic, she is pro-Palestine, she talks about other parliament ministers because I was also very vocal to right-wing parties and their policy making. And um, from still now on they are using this collage. So the collage and these tweets are still going viral, they are still using it. I'm like, okay, been there, done that. But at that time it was very shocking to me to see that how far they went to look at uh, maybe when you were very young, you, t- you said it in the, in the cafe, but now I just drop it on Twitter and they used it. Um, I will not show all the tweets because I don't want to give it a platform, but just to know uh, what was happening at that time. Here you can see is from the Standard. The Standard is a Flemish newspaper. They made an analysis of this thing that happened to me. And this was for me the first red flag that they were orchestrating a campaign an online hate racist campaign against me. Um, here you can see in one week how many tweets they, t- they, they were around me and around my case. Because on Monday I announced that I'm going to work for VRT News and then there were a lot of, lot of tweets. And then uh, midweek, a journalist started the hashtag Je suis jihad van Pembroke to support me. But in total, there were mostly 10,000 tweets about uh, what was happening. The online campaign uh, that they already started, uh, things got a lot viral. The negative uh, tweets, of course, went viral. And then uh, it started positive with congr- congratulations, but then it went all negative uh, because of what they uh, were doing and trying to do. And then it went silent. So they actually um, did what they wanted to do. Eh? The, the, the strategy that they tried to do is silence people and um, make them, uh, yeah, that's a way of trolling and silence people. And I went silent. Eh? The, the, I was working as a very young uh, woman at VRT News and my boss told me, just focus on your job. We are still supporting you. I, I didn't show it here, but actually, a journalist made an article with the title Why Jihad van Pembroke can work at VRT News. So they use even the frame of them to show them this is why she can work actually. Um, and I never publicly gave a reaction. So at that time I used to be, I, I said I'm going to be silent, focusing on my job and just let it pass. At that time I didn't know it was a coping way of what was happening to me. Then fast forward to 2018, so in January 2018, I started to work there, and in 2018, September, the documentary came out. So for me, it was a very, very um, weird thing to see this documentary, so because it was for me like, oh my God, it's not between my two ears, it's actually also happened to me. But I was not aware of it that this campaign started uh, at that time. 
But um, I became silent, and I was also silent for, uh, for two years. Uh, I, I, the documentary came online, and I didn't know what I needed to do. Um, and I stayed silent the years after. So it was very difficult for me to come out with my story because I knew what was what happened. Uh, but I worked for two years at VRT News and I never told anyone, anyone what am I going to do with this uh, yeah, in a justice kind of way. So I didn't immediately become a civil party at that time. So when the documentary came out, I was just doing some research. Okay, how can I... Uh, uh, do something because what was happened was not normal. It was very an orchestrated uh, online hate campaign, a racism campaign, and it was because I am a Muslim woman, uh, a woman uh, with migration background, um, a, a woman of color, and that's the reason why I also got attacked. So it's not from the blue they chose someone who is working at there at that time to attack me. It was with a kind, with a vicious, malicious reason that they attacked me and uh, I've, um, gone, I did some, um, I, don't, I uh, contacted UNIA. UNIA is an independent public institution that fights discrimination just to ask what, am I, what can I do to defend myself because what happened uh, is not normal. They helped me with the legal procedures and then I had um, access to the investigation uh, file. So the investigation was already uh, started and I had access to the investigation file and in the investigation file, that was the moment where my uh, mount really opened up, uh, of my eyes opened up actually. There was a file with the name Jihad Fan and it was a, a map uh, on the server with 200 pages of conversations about me. So it was an anonymous Discord group, but in this anonymous Discord group, there was a group uh, under, under it with 500 members and all conversation, how they can destroy me, how they can fire me. So you can, I wrote all the process and how this all happened to me when I started to work. So find her tweets, make her memes, start an email to fire her. She is, her, her father is a, a Belgian, but he uh, converted to Islam. So everything they wanted to know about me was discussed there. And from that moment, I decided, okay, now I need to be a civil party because I want him to get convicted. So just to give like a little uh, date, because it's a lot of information, I know. So in 2018, I became an uh, employment at VRT News and documentaries uh, came out and investigation started. In 2018, I had access to the investigation, but at the same time, Dries van Langenhoven became a member of the parliament. For, for me, it was also the reason why I became silent, because I was going to give uh, a court loss a lawsuit against someone who is in the parliament, and I, I am just uh, a woman, uh, yeah, was very vocal and so on, but for me it was uh, very scary to see the media using me versus Dries Van over the, the things were not equal. And in February 2022, uh, 20, uh, in 20, I became a civil party. So it took me a long time to decide when I'm going to civil, being a civil party or not. And from then on, I decided to remain in silence is not an option. In December 2021, I publicly announced that I'm a civil party. And I did it very specifically with a podcast, Zwijgen is geen opties, silence is not an option, because I didn't want to use mainstream media to give my uh, story, because I was not, I didn't trust them at that time how they will use my story. So here I announced that I'm a civil party, and from there on, the public uh, way of announcing this uh, court case uh, started. What are the difficulties of this court uh, suit, of this lawsuit? Here you have example for a meme that they used and they are still using it and, and um, bring, it, bring in it. The criminal trial is very an obstruction carousel. I already told you six years, uh, it took our six years to get him convicted, but the, there is Valangenove, and also you can see here other members of Schild and Vrinde, so we, they were with 500, but the uh, public prosecution uh, chose six or uh, seven uh, members also to be, to be convicted. But they, are, they use very t a kind of tactics, like you see at what Trump's using uh, to delay all these uh, court cases. And they even talked about illegal judges. So the judges are illegal, 
legal, they are left right, uh, they are left, uh, left judges, they are not neutral and so on. And also, because that's why I mentioned his parliament immunity, his parliament immunity was not legally waived for my case. So what they did, the lower court said, his parliament immunity was still on for me personally. So they actually told me you can't be a civil party because his parliament immunity was still on. So I had to appeal it to eventually um, become a civil party. But that's appealing, and that's also the biggest mindfuck of all, all this... Uh, lawsuit that I, that this, this process I went through, I had to pay uh, 8,000 euros to all these members of Schild and Vrienden, and also Dries van Angeneva, me as a victim, as a target, had to pay 8,000 euros because, um, yeah, if that's, that's how also how law system works. Law system is also, I have a lot of questions about the law system, now I'm an expert uh, of this topic, said my, my lawyer said it. But I had to pay 8,000 euros because at the lower court I lost being a civil party, so they say, yeah, you, are, uh, you did an appeal, so now you have to pay because you lost. So me as a victim had to pay 8,000 euros and some civil parties started a, a fundraising. Uh, here you can see Jihad van Pembroek and her gang. I used the word haar bende and her gang because uh, Dries van Langenhoven tweeted about me. Yeah, now Jihad van Pembroek and her gang has to pay. Ha ha ha, I won. But I used his words to give my own narrative on it. And in less than 24 hours, I got the money, luckily. And at that time, journalists and also Dries van Langenhoven knew okay, she has a lot of people around her because in less than 24 hours she got 8,000 and even more. Uh, we need to get uh, still an eye on her. Of course, a lot of fake news. There was a lot of fake news going on about me as a civil party. Dries van Langenhoven had a lot of fake news about this lawsuit. Uh, he kept targeting me. So here we have a screenshot of his Telegram group where he said, yeah, at the same time, I was also um, a co-president of an anti-racist organization. And he said, look how, how much money she gets as a president, but I'm, I'm doing it at free at a as a volunteer. But he was still targeting me, even when the lawsuit was started, even when I became a civil party. I was, it was not that he got scared. That's very known with far right uh, people and narcissist people. They keep still targeting me. And of course, uh, that's something that's not being highlighted a lot. Uh, it was a racism trauma for me. At that time, when it happened in 2018, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna focus on my job and it will all be f uh, over. But it took me a while to, to search for physical help, like psychological help. And the therapist specialized in racism worked with me. And at the same time, she mentioned you have a racism trauma, eh? PTSD, but then on focused on racism. And she also used that word, uh, including in the court report. Uh, another difficulty is I was not the only civil party. There were also other civil parties, of course. We were five in total, and but I am the only one who has been personally attacked and affected by Dries van Langenhoven and Schild en Vrienden. There were two human rights organizations uh, who are doing it for the common, uh, yeah, for because it's a mission and their vision and to you, to have a president on it. The University of Ghent, because Dries van Langenhoven was also a student at the university and a, a representative of the university and one honorary magistrate, uh, here you can see him on the picture, whose parents were in a concentration camp and after the documentary went online, he went immediately to the court, uh, to the police to make himself a civil party. But I had a lot, uh, Henry Hermans is a very, uh, uh, very important person in my process uh, because he was also a judge in the highest court of Belgium, and now he was, uh, of course, uh, not anymore, but he knew a lot how the system works. And despite what to, what to achieve, and we want the same goal, we want to have uh, Dries van Langenhoven convicted, it was not always easy to work well together, because for me personally, I already, I already work 10 years about anti-racism on a structural level. So I give policy, policy uh, organized manifestation. But at the first time, it was me personally that got attacked. So it was difficult to give, at the same time, advice to these organizations, but at the same time, also want to focus on my strategy and not always to, to find that we cannot always work together. 
What was my strategy and the lessons? Here you see a picture that what I discussed with my uh, lawyer. Um, maybe also important, uh, just a side event, side note. My lawyer is also from Moroccan um, migration background. Also, Dries Falangenhove targeted him. He also defended some uh, serious uh, terrorist people. So they all used in the narrative like she is, her lawyer is a an, an Moroccan man who defended terrorists and so on and so on. So it was very vicious to see how this lawsuit also attacked other people. The strategy, as you know, or maybe known from the beginning, there was no strategy at first time. I thought I had to do this on my own eh, because I was very ashamed of what happened. Uh, that's also the reason why no, uh, still even I, am, I have a lot of activists around me. I know a lot of organizations, but everyone was shocked. How do you come four years after what happened to us and saying that you are part of this very milestone lawsuit, that you are part of it? You are very, it's very important work and you can't do it by your own. But at that time, I thought I have to do it on my own. Defining my own narrative was very important. As someone who already worked at the media, I saw the frames and the narrative they use. So for me, it was very important that I, I, I if I'm going to come publicly with this, what happened, I need to show my voice at my way and on my way. So I used my own social media challenge, I, uh, channels I used for the podcast uh, that I showed you uh, previously. And I used anti-racist platforms where I uh, communicated about the case. It was very at last that I did an interview with journalists, but even that was not a nice experience because journalists really want to focus on the trauma porn and not on the actually uh, thing that happens, on the, the impact that it has on our society and focusing more on are you okay and how it's going? And it's very good that they ask these questions, but they are not focusing on the, the very impact that it, this lawsuit has on our society. Uh, eventually, I surrounded myself with activists and anti-racist civil societies who were very good at communication organizations. So for me, uh, they saw the civil organizations, especially on anti-racism, saw, okay, this, this lawsuit is very historical, very important for minorities. Uh, we need to work together to organize, so they launched a petition. Uh, here you can see it. I'm, I am in, with solidarity with targets of uh, Schild en Vrinde. Very important because I'm also very focused on language. They never used the word victims. They used the word doelwitten or targets because we got especially got targeted for our minority background or uh, other uh, identity uh, things. So they, we work together. Um, that's the other uh, strategy. The, this work or work or working on anti-racism is not only the work of anti-racist organizations. So we work together with LGBTQ movements, Jewish movements, uh, feminist uh, movements. So they all work together to organize the petition, to organize um, what was happening and the communication about the lawsuit because there was a lot of fake news around it. And this was very interesting to see that the f it actually it was the first time that in civil society organization in Belgium worked together because they all got affected by Schild en Vrinde. Because I see anti-racism, especially um, traditional organizations are like, yeah, it's very difficult to work on that and it's very, uh, difficult because they have no knowledge about it, um, but we, are, we were all targets of uh, Schild en Vrinde. Here you have an action because uh, when the lawsuit started, they did an, uh, an action on, on, outside the, the court uh, building where they had like the pamphlets with who is targeted and there's a lot of people who got targeted. So I am personally one of the people who got targeted as of my minority background, as a Muslim woman, and so the different intersectionality layers. Um, but I, I see that it, there are a lot of different other people who also got targeted, but they never became a civil party, for which reasons, yeah, the, just, the system is just not easy to get your case uh, won. So, at the end, um, the conviction happened, uh, luckily. I was uh, very shocked, actually, because uh, after six years, I was not positive anymore. I was like, okay, it became business as usual. That's very weird to say. But every time I was being uh, uh, called to come to the, this court, 
Um, and always they, they, they delayed it because something happened, illegal judges, they need extra investigation. Um, and I felt that I, I was not being hurt, but I kept doing what I was doing because I was seeing it was not only for myself, for myself, I already gave up personally to want to win, but I was like, okay, it's a very historical thing, uh, and I'm not doing it for myself, but all the other people who are watching me, because after the conviction, I got a lot of messages of women, women of color, were saying thank you, because you did this also for us. We were scared. We are, after, it's, it's very sad to hear, um, I work with youngsters, and some youngsters with Muslim backgrounds say, after what has happened to you, we, we got scared to tweet and to give our opinion. So as you see, for me, it was a personal case, but the impact of women and youngsters, women of color, was very, um, was, was a lot. So he got one year effective prison, so uh, I was never expecting it, uh, for violation of racism and negotiationism law. He got a total fine of 16,000 16, euros, uh, 10 months of re reprieve for possession of weapons, and also interesting and important, uh, deprived of his civil rights for 10 years. That means in 10 years he can't come, become a parliament member uh, anymore. Uh, but uh, of course he appealed. Um, it's very important to know that in this last sort of six years, Drisva, I never saw Dries Falangenhove at the first time. He became, he was one time there at the uh, court, but I was not, I was on a honeymoon. Luckily I went to my honeymoon and not to this court. I told the judge, please delay the court, uh, court date. It's very important to hear my voice. But uh, it's also a way of coping with it. I used to say uh, this uh, law, uh, this court system is uh, this court uh, suit of the law court. It's not only uh, it's one thing of me. It's not only what I have. So I chose for myself because it took a lot, a lot of years also. Uh, but luckily, I was very happy that I got protected in a way that the not being there because it was a circus, a lot of media, and they also decided uh, we have to. Uh, to decide a new court date. So they decided a new court date and then there was, he was not anymore there. And at the conviction, he was also not there. There was only one person who also not, uh, not uh, being convicted because he said uh, apology and it was very uh, true, uh, his apology. Uh, but he now appealed, and at the same time, he never uh, defended himself. So within six years, his, judge, his lawyer only said, it's, you are legal judges, and then he went on. So that's the only argument that we heard, and uh, now he appealed. He said, "I'm not. We are not. Uh, uh, we are not uh, uh, focusing on this conviction. So it's it's going back to a new court. Uh, we don't know the date anymore, but um, we don't know what's going to stay or what's going to change of the conviction." So, voila, that's my story. I, I, sorry, I forgot one thing to say, because these are very general convictions, but he also got convicted for me personally, something that I forgot to mention. Uh, I won uh, because the judge uh, said uh, there was like a psychological violence, psych yeah, psychological violence against me, and the judge explicitly mentioned my name at the conviction. So that was also for me a big thing to give it a closure after six years that he mentioned my name personally and acknowledge the, 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 the things that I, uh, happened to me. Wow. In the struggle for people with color, um, we would usually say before you backlash a black woman, um, you ask the person first, how are you doing? How are you, Jihad? <laughs> <laughs> now I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much for this detailed presentation. This is really amazing. And um, once again, um, kudos to you uh, for your bravery, for your courage. Um, I will just take it up from, you got to know about this in 2018, but then it started before that. Um, once you realize that, okay, this is something serious or let's say first time when you heard about this how did you feel yeah i was um at, in my gut feeling i felt that when i'm going to start at vrt news some people will 
criticize it because of course I was actually very pu publicly, I was very open uh, giving my opinion. So I already mentioned to my boss, you know my history, just to be sure, but it was before the attack. So in my gut feeling, I felt something will happen, but I was never, I was very shocked when the tweets and the tweet collage and my old past was very digged in. That was for me the biggest shock. Um, and uh, at that time, uh, a lot of people tell me then, we never heard you anymore. So they, they very were, they won actually about how they did the strategy, uh, but it was after four or five years that I just found again how I can, uh, can yeah, come up to my voice back. Um, you know, it's like, when I watched the video, and then, you know, having to know that you, um, won the case, I was like, okay, how courageous, like going on a trial for six years. So I was like, if this was me, I would just pack my bags and go back to Africa. <laughs> because I, 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 I mean, I'm like, I can't take this, um, but at least you, you, I mean, your dad is a Belgian, but then I was like, okay, see it's privilege at some point, at least you're white, <laughs> at least you have a Belgian background, Compared to someone totally new, let's say a black person like me, um, a Muslim, um, having a veil extra on that, and then having a not just immigrant background but a refugee background, and being that really advocate, how would you think the case might be? Would it still be on my favor? Of course, the law would do its work, but then if you were in someone's shoe like this, how do you think the trial might yeah. go? Actually, there is, a, there is a black woman who got also attacked by Dries Falangenhove and she's a good friend of me. She was the first one who got uh, her public opinion about racism. She's actually our voice in Belgium about racism. And I said to her, please also become a civil party so we can do it together. But she chose not to do it exactly for the reason she was a mom with three kids. She said, actually, I, I can't do it. I have other priorities. And for me, how did I keep kept up six years? It was for her, but also... Yeah, and amazing, thank you, Struggle, to not just say, I'll do it for myself, but I mean, this is how I do my activism as well. I'm like, I'm not doing it for myself. Maybe I might not change anything, but for the next generation. And I think this is good that um, you don't do it with expectations, but you do it for the next generation, hoping that it would change something, and thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, and I was wondering, I mean, Belgium is big and there is a lot of activists and of course, like very strong and vocal people there that a whole far right party would actually might attack or mount the same um, attack on what they did to you. But no, they choose you. One, because yeah, your name Jihad. <laughs> Sorry for that. But then it was also mentioned. We all, we've all seen that. But what do you think that you were so unique that they think you... Because for me, I think you were so unique, right? So what do you think that they've seen in you? Um, I'm sure you're not the only person that I would actually tweet on Muslim, for Muslim communities in Palestine. But what was unique about yeah. you? Yeah, I am very proud of my name, just to mention it, so I'm not yeah. sorry for that. Uh, I'm very proud of my name. Maybe if you don't know my name, uh, actually means uh, striving. I don't know the, the words in English, streven. Um, so um, if my name was Jolien van Pembroek, I also thought it in my post podcast, nobody will give a fuck. I will work at VRT News. I'm a white woman with the name Jolene van Pembroek and they will forget about me. But it was because of my forename as you had. It was because I am a Muslim woman. It was because I'm a woman of color and a migration background. And my father is also a Muslim because I forgot my, my name is van Pembroek. So what is happening with your combination it gives a lot of error uh, mind fucks in some people's heads. Um, and these are the reasons, but at the same time, it was also that I was very vocal and ambitious. 
You can see in the when I was uh, having uh, the the investigation files with me, and also in the documentary, you can see that they were focused on different kind of people with migration background. For example, one other person who is now the uh, president of a political party was also being kept an eye on. So they kept an eye on different people, uh, especially women, but also other people who they know they are very ambitious when they are going to take a step to somewhere, we're going to act, attack them and destroy them. So when I decided to join VRT News, that was their time to actually use everything they, they already found of me. Being unique of whatever you do uh, that actually uh, made you to be targeted, right? And um, I was thinking like, what is the intersection between digital oppression um, and the broader social justice movements? And what strategies do you believe that could actually, or that are effective in combating such targeted cases? Yes. Yeah. So especially dig digital oppression, um, so my case, someone who started to work and they wanted to destroy me and got fired, it actually happened to other people before me with a migration background. So it's, it's a, not a unique tactic of far right to use it. Um, and for civil uh, organizations, the, the way of justice or the using the law system is one of the tactics to, uh, to fight digital oppression. Other things is also, yeah, the justice system is something to use to fight racism. Um, but like I said in my strategy, it was the first time digital oppression uh, was focused on the intersectionality of different targets, uh, different minorities to work together because in civil society organizations don't always work together, so this intersectionality. And at the same time, I see that a lot of organizations want to focus and to understand them. Why are they doing this? Why are they using these tactics? But I feel it's now a waste of time to focus on them, but we need to focus on the targets and how we can focus on bystanders, uh, how to focus on uh, strategies so that they can defend themselves. So for me, that's the connection I see. And, you know, like, you were digitally oppressed, right? And I was wondering were there any, like, physical attacks? Um, was the court or do you had any support that was like in terms of security, right? Because, I mean, if I would have the courage to say, okay, I'm going to fight this for somebody else or for the next generation, um, I would, might think of like looking for securities. Did you have this privilege or you were just doing your thing with the support of or this digitally or through yeah. the court? So my attack was mostly online. Um, I never got luckily physically violence, but uh, like I give the example of the black uh, black woman, my friend, Adalila Hermans, she got, uh, for example, the same digital oppression and she got cameras on her front door because her address was online. Um, so for me personally, I had to, the, the luck, but I remember when I announced that I became a civil party, it was in Corona and I was very happy that I had a, a mask. I'm, maybe I was the only one who was happy at that time, that wearing a mask, but I was not being recognized. Um, so I felt uh, a little bit afraid um, and I had uh, luckily a network around me that can, could protect me. Yeah. Mm. Could you tell us maybe specific challenges that you, um, actually faced during this digital, um, this digital oppression that you were going through? What I was going through? Or if, if there were specific challenges that you oh, were challenges, facing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, the first challenge is I was working at a new job and I got attacked and my tweets got online, uh, coping in a work floor that is mostly white and very focusing on hierarchy and uh, I was just the new one. So that was the most, that was the first challenge. I felt I was in a golden cage. Um, the other challenge was of course, um, um, how to get to tell my personal story and at the same time show what the, the, the big structural level is because I feel that my personal story is like, ah, you personally, uh, 
had it, so I'm sorry for you, but it won't happen again. No, it will still happen at other people because it's a structural way of tactics they use, and we need to stop it. So that was like the, uh, the difficulty that I had. Um, the other ones um, were, of course, the time and the energy to always be popped up a letter and to be again there and always see that uh, the how law system is not very helpful to victims because you have to know how the system works. Apropos like telling your own story, um, how was that? Why, why do you think it's um, for the first time you're actually telling your story publicly? Why do you think it's the right time to do this now? For now? Yeah, ah. like, you, you decided, okay, I wait till the verdict is done, then I know the outcome. Would you have still tell your story if you had lost? Yeah, so the f and it happened in 2018, but it was only until 2022, actually, that I told my story, so it took me a while. Um, I think um, being vulnerable, at first, I thought it was a weak strengths it was a weak a weakness but now i felt that it's very strong that i not being vulnerable uh, being vulnerable but at the same time telling my story so um and i also after that uh, when my therapist told me i have a racism trauma uh talking about it was very difficult so at the first time i told it for my new uh, employees it's not VRT news i changed my work Telling them to other people, to my friends, to my friends' activists, I got uh, panic attacks. So um, I had to be very prepared uh, on, a, on a mentally level to, ex to tell it, but also on a strategy level. Okay, I'm going to tell it now, how I'm going to organize myself. Uh, so I need to always be two steps before Dries van because he was now a member of a parliament. So even in the parliament, they, he, uh, his uh, party, political party, asked questions about me. So parliamentary questions. Just for example, I work in another workplace. Okay, how, why is she working there? So they still kept using their power to keep, keep, keep targeting me, yeah. The role of um, journalists and, of course, the media in hold was also as well a crucial role that actually plays um, in your case. And I was wondering if you could tell us, like, how can media literacy and responsible reporting contribute to countering digital manipulation and um, disinformation campaigns? Yeah, um, for me, media won't help at that things at those things um they did this documentary and i was very it was very good but they also got a lot of critique you made schild and vrienden bigger even for the lawsuit they say you made schild and vrienden bigger but it's, it was very important work but the documentary was where you were like here is the red flag yeah here is the red yeah i already had some red flags but for me it was then then the biggest eye opener but i see that media now is not using their platform to cover digital oppression, to cover uh, far right. They even give it more a platform. It's even a revenue model to using clickbaits to give them a platform, especially in Belgium and, and the, the Flemish public broadcast. They say, yeah, we need to give a voice to left and right, and then we are neutral. So they don't see what the impact is of far right. Um, and how I think media can use digital, uh, how to fight digital oppression is to moderate their online reactions, for example. I worked for social media. I saw that people don't read the article. They just have like, refugees, okay, attack. Uh, Muslims, okay, attack. And they don't moderate the online hate. So that's a first important thing. Get your moderation straight and use uh, moderation and, 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 and rules to, to that and at the same time don't give a platform to far right because you are giving and you are even media is even using the words of far right that's also very prevalent don't use the words and the narrative of far right um, but because that is what now happening in Belgium so we talk about the media if you talk about the media of course we look at policy makers and uh, tech companies because at some point it's all part of like um, the digital platforms the all such campaigns and whatever is happening across the world. Um, I was thinking, how do you think uh, policymakers and tech companies and, of course, journalists could actually work together to address um, plurifications of hate speech and extremist content online? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, 
it's um, there was an anti-racist organization, Kif Kif, who also did the research on online hate of women of color in Belgium, and at the end they made a policy advice for uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders. Um, and I also worked on this report. The first thing is, uh, yeah, social media companies have a, a responsibility. Uh, their revenue model is also focusing on far right and online hate. So um, policymakers can actually make laws and uh, policy making about how the social media companies use their platform. The other thing is um, how can um, victims of digital oppression and online racism uh, protect themselves? Um, it was, um, it's not easy as an individual. So how is the law system protecting and helping uh, civil uh, victims? Um, and also um, policymakers have a very, have a very important uh, way of uh, how they, they even um, exaggerate online hate sometimes. So they sometimes give, not sometimes, they always give two groups against each other to use it and to give more online hate. And um, that's something very uh, toxic that's happening. Um, and the other thing that I see is very important is um, the focusing on bystanders. I see that if you check online racism and online hate, you see a lot of reactions of far right racist people, but never someone who reacts and say, okay, this is not okay, this is racist. And because people also are scared, but the number of the how bigger, they just need to start one person and then others will also mention. So I always tell to other, especially white uh, people, please react because it's easier that you will react on online racism than that me as a minority or a woman of color or a people of color react because then we will also be attacked even more. I mean, your resilience in the face of adversity is actually um, truly remarkable. And um, one of, I don't know if I should call that strategy, that you use was being silent, right? And mostly it said that um, silence is the best weapon um, to achieve so many things. And also maybe to confuse your enemy because he or she might not know where you're heading to. Um, can you share with us some of the insights um, on the strategies that you actually use that really help you to get to where, or to what we are talking about today. Yeah. So yeah, the strategy to be silenced was uh, not a strategy for me personally because they. Uh, it was a goal of this campaign to make me silent. So eventually, they, their goal uh, was uh, they won by by this uh, tactic. Um, yeah, my strategy was mostly at the first time when I see how I coped with it, I was very long silence because I was just searching how I'm going to tell it to in private life, but also in my activist life. So um, I, a colleague of me said, okay, Jihad, you are a civil party. You need to give us orders to tell us what we need to do. And I know you are personally attacked. I know you have a lot of strategy things in mind, but just tell us what to do so we can be around you and organize this petition, organize this events outside the court building, uh, do this fundraising. At first I thought I need to do this on my own because it's my, I am a civil party, but then I got connected with a lot of activists, civil organizations. For example, there was a WhatsApp group where activists were searching at the online hate and the fake news that was around this case and always to debunk, debunk this fake news and do to uh, have these reactions uh, reported. So this is how I see that what was really working because they focus on the organization, but at the same time also on the communication. What is the narrative? What are the words that I need to use to give my story a good uh, platform? With who am I going to talk at the podcast, for example, also thanks to another activist who told me use this platform um, but I was also very lucky I already had a network I was already an activist I was also already in those uh, organizations um, 
So we have like um, less than five minutes to wrap up, but you can already prepare your questions. We have a few more, two, three more questions to go. So just prepare it. Uh, we will come back to you. So Jihad, looking ahead, what do you envision as the um, next steps in the ongoing struggle against digital authoritarianism and how can individuals um, and communities support such an effort? Yes, so the conviction is a very important uh, thing in digital oppression. I feel that um, after that, people will think twice to give online hate reactions. For example, after the conviction, someone, just a woman with two kids, a public profile, sent me a message saying some hateful messages again. And I told her, thank you, I will send it to my lawyer and the police. And she immediately erased her reaction. So this is something that people can use, especially in Belgium then. Uh, we can use it to protect ourselves more and to say this is the end. We go not further anymore. We have a law system. Um, and the other things is... Um, yeah, how can we each other protect uh, ourselves? What are the things of the strategy? What are the environments we 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 go through uh, in online uh, systems? But I think I already told you what I what I said before. The bystanders is very important. Uh, but at the same time, also how can we use social media platforms? For example, my Twitter page. Um, I have a lot of things that where I can hide all the reactions to protect myself personally. So there are a lot of different kind of tactics to, to work on it. And especially for digital oppression, um, I feel that uh, the justice system is a one way, but we have also our policy, uh, like policy makers, uh, we have elections uh, in two months, how political parties are going to use it and how to protect us at the same time. And uh, civil organizations, I feel that activists um, now see the impact of digital oppression and are now thinking about tactics and uh, strategies. And uh, to my last second to last question, so two minutes. So, um, in light of recent developments in your case, um, what message uh, do you hope to convey to other activists who may be facing similar challenges in their fight to or fight for justice and equality? Yeah, the first thing is I am not a very good motivational speaker, so I will say I'm, it's normal that you are tired. I'm tired too. <laughs> Um, so that's, and um, I feel that the, it took me a while to say that this battle, uh, I couldn't do this on my own, so that will be the most important thing. Don't do it on your own. It's very okay to search for help, help in activist network, help in psychological help, um, and to surround yourself with others and to say, uh, let's do it together to change some things um, and to, to have an impact on our society. You said you were tired. I often say I am tired, but don't give up. Um, just to give one example, last year um, on the street, I met a guy, a white person. Um, I was rusting and the guy just split on me. and was like, you black Muslim, uh, gay so like in German, go back to your country. And I was shocked, stunned, and I couldn't just say anything. You know, I was like, Okay, so then there was a guy beside me. He was like, I saw what happened. Do you know the register teller? You know you can report this case and so on. I'm like, they're colleagues. I work with them. And he was like, yeah, let's document this. I'm like, I don't know you, but I am tired. Um, and for me, it was a decision to say, I am tired of um, all those racial attacks, personally, especially on the street. I'm like, the only thing I could take in Germany now, I think it's just the bureaucracy, dealing with papers and laws and so on, but not on personal and so on. So don't give up. You can be tired, but keep going. Finally, my last question, what advice would you give to policymakers, activists, and ordinary citizens who are committed to challenging digital authoritarianism and promoting a more equitable and just society? I think the most important advice is to uh, destroy far right is not using the words of far right because you are doing the same. Okay, I actually, are you optimistic of the future or are you afraid? That's a good question. Yeah, we have elections in two months and yeah. um, uh, the, flat, the far right political party is a very big one in the, in the polls. 
Um, I don't know yet. I feel very. I am. I'm, I'm. For me personally, I'm focused on my environment and uh, the change that I want to make there, and I'm not focusing on understanding why people are far right or racism because it's a waste of my time. Um, well, okay. Actually, not just um, um, not just beat the far right, but I think it's also scary. Look, see, look, watching this video, there are young people. So when I watched it, I'm like, oh, I thought racism is really huge in Germany, especially last year. There was this um, um, Vox Pop on Europe and Germany turns out to be like number one. And I was like, okay. But then when I watched this video, I'm like, oh, okay. There is more pepper in Belgium than in Germany. <laughs> um, so yeah, just to add, it's not about, because I hear a lot of, it's, it's a freedom of speech and it's all just memes. The documentary shows when it, if it will not, if, it, if this documentary wasn't there, how, where was it going to end? It will be actually using physical violence. They had weapons, they were doing uh, weapon camps in Hungary, for example. So we didn't know where it was going to end. Um, so the racist attacks, uh, on a physical level is actually a very dangerous way. There was an uh, example uh, last week, an uh, article uh, in Belgium, where a journalist went to the TikTok algorithm and being a far right youngster of 15 years old. And at one week, he was already in a telegram group with other youngsters talking about far right and using violence and so on. So it's very not in 2018 happening, it's still happening. It's only now that Schild and Vrienden doesn't exist anymore because they got exposed but it's still going on of course thank you very much we will now take questions so before we take questions i hope that your story would not just motivate but it will make a huge impact not just in belgium but across the whole world um looking at the verdict that uh, uh we, we we've all witnessed last month i think the justice is um um how would you call it i don't know if i should what use the word fair but there is hope so we will take questions on that note. So I saw a hand, one. Okay, we, we just start with the online question first, <laughs> here yeah. from the background, because I think it's quite related to yeah, where you ended. Uh, so the question is, what do you make of the political situation in Belgium today and in regards to the upcoming election? And it's also coming from our past speaker, so... So can yeah. you repeat the question? Uh, what do you make of the political situation in Belgium today and uh, all this in regards to the upcoming election? So you yeah. touched upon it, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so after the conviction, there were a lot of speculation, a lot of articles and analyses. Uh, did Schild and Vrienden now won or did they lose because they got convicted? The, the reason that they get an effective prison is a, a very important win. In the political situation, I felt a uh, disappointed that political parties were now very silent. Only left parties give a reaction. And when the documentary came online, uh, every, every political party was vocal, um, but now they were silent because they know the power of uh, far right. And there are elections, of course, so they won't, they won't lose voters who maybe will vote for them and are also a little bit racist or just uh, racist uh, a lot. Um, I see a shift of how our law system actually works on anti-racism. So on the interpersonal level, I see a shift of people who are now um, using this as fighting online hate. But the political situation, I feel uh, Vlaams Belang has uh, still a lot uh, of uh, people around them. And Dries Valangenhove is not a parliament member anymore. It's also strategy-wise, strategy uh, because Vlaams Belang wants to govern, wants to be in the government, and if they have a convicted uh, person in, this, in, his, in their party, they won't be a uh, government. But the right political, the right conservative political party, uh, they got a lot of questions. What are you going to do with the far right? What are, what are your opinion about Dries Valangenhove? They have to show their true colors. So that is also what is what I see. They have to tell explicitly. explicitly they don't want to work with far right, and if you don't tell it, actually you are saying you want to work with them. Do we have another question online first? Um, yeah, if not, yeah. Um, 
Sorry, thanks uh, for an excellent presentation and congratulations on winning the case. My question is about the social media platforms. Uh, while all of this was going on, clearly you were targeted online. Uh, whether you noticed or whether you actually reached out to any of the platforms where a lot of this harassment was taking place and whether the content that was put out was taken down and how quickly, if any, of a reaction you received from the platforms. So I uh, didn't contact the platforms. Um, I did when my when the tweets, I, that's not something that I tell, to, told. When this uh, tweet collage of me went viral with all my tweets about Palestine and that I'm anti-Semitic and so on, I had a panic reaction and I deleted all my tweets so nobody would find it anymore. Um, and uh, I reported a lot of tweets at that time and I always got the reaction back then on Twitter that uh, it's not violent with the, it's not vi the, the rules are not violence and so on. Um, <laughs> So even anonymous accounts could still uh, going viral. Um, so I felt that social media platforms didn't protect me at all. Uh, they even got it, make it made it even worse uh, because they st the the tweets are still going on. I st we still report now in numerous people because I have a WhatsApp group, so everyone will do the same effort at once. But I don't see a change. Uh, the only thing that I changed is how uh, now X can uh, filter some reactions so I don't see everything anymore. I don't see the, the, the very, very racist things anymore. Yeah, okay. But it's still on the platform, of course. Um, thank you, both of you. Um, Jihad, I'm most interested, like you've talked a lot about the policy side in Belgium, but I'm also interested in the education side. Like how would you assess the progress that you you could tell us a little bit about before and after you won the case? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Also education. Um, I feel after the documentary, uh, a lot of uh, schools use this documentary to talk about the impact of far right. And we also have an or a civil organization who works uh, on um, knowledge of using media and online media. So they gave a lot of workshops to youngsters to use how to use online media, how to react on online hate. And after the I won the case, I got a lot of questions of schools to tell my story, but at the same time also to tell, to give advice to youngsters how they can cope with online hate. Not in the way they got attacked by online hate, but how to react on online hate. Because you hear a lot of things like, just ignore it, it you, you, just ignore it and, and, and just hide it. But there are different kinds of tactics to go on with online hate. And ignore it is not the right, uh, it can be the right tactic, but you have different kind of ways to react on online hate. Um, the other thing on education is um, a lot of now uh, different civil organizations are now organizing workshops to uh, just um, yeah people uh, from everywhere um, yeah civil civil people um, to how how can we react on online hate how can we protect ourselves on online hate what are the tactics that are used to so they give the knowledge with the court case, of course, in the background, to to give me people more of like tips and tricks to use it on the on their platforms. So there is a shift, uh, but yeah, you have you can give a lot of uh, policy to uh, to schools and to teachers, but it took also a lot of time to change that. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I wanted to ask, after all the six years and everything you've kind of been through also personally, um, what you think has changed for you? Have you noticed that you've changed or your career ideas or how you use your public voice? Yeah, um, for me, yeah, of course, it changed uh, a lot uh, when I started it and when it ended. Um, it's not finished, still not finished. Um, I'm very, it's, it's very weird to, after, if my, my friends tell me, you will be in the historical books of everything that you're now doing. It's very weird to hear that because I'm like, I don't see it this way. But at the same time, I'm very proud of the way I, I handled it and I went on. Uh, but also uh, how I changed on, 
um, being that this court case is very heavy on my shoulder and every time I got a letter, I got a panic attack and every time Drissa Langer over tweeted, I got a panic, a panic attack. And I was very focusing on the strategy and the rationality of how to cope with it. But I changed also in my, for me personally, to focus on my mental health, to how I'm going to cope with that, um, and how I'm going to make this court case just one thing of me. So I was very afraid that pe when people will see me, they will see, ah, this is Jet van Pembroek of this court case, but I'm just, I'm more than just the court case. So I also uh, felt that this was important for me that to tell the world I am a civil party of the court case, but I am not the court case. I am more than that. Um, I am also an expert in anti-racism and, and inclusive communication. And when people ask me, yeah, tell me about more about your court case and give a, a witness uh, about it, I say I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm not a uh, victim only. I'm also an expert of what the, what the structural things is happening, and I will tell this also on this in this way. And um, for me, it was also an eye opener how uh, some things I did to protect myself, even if the public opinion was expecting that I will do it. For example, eh, when the court case date was uh, being told, I was not here in Belgium. Um, I felt very sad that I wasn't there, but at the same time I got protected because I just did what I wanted to do, focusing on my life, focusing on my uh, happiness. Um, but I see how I now can use everything that is happening to still tell the story and use my voice. Uh, and also a lot to youngsters. I work with a lot of youngsters. And for me, this is my strength to, to tell them, keep doing what you're doing because it's very important. The next generation of activists are very afraid to be an, act to be an activist in Belgium uh, because of what happened. Do we have a question? Both online and here. Um, if no, I'm, 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 I believe some of Oda. Okay, so. Jihad is here, you can still um, talk to her later on. But then I, something just came in in relation to this question, like um, you are not just in the history book, but, but you are also one of the very famous <laughs> persons in Belgium or across Europe because of this. How are you, or what impact does this brought personally to you and the whole activism really um, let's say in Belgium. I don't think I see it that way. <laughs> um, yeah, I. Uh, I don't know. I, I think a lot of. I was very happy with when the conviction felt, and I had a lot of reactions, a lot of, of professional activists who sent me message. Thank you for your resilience and to f to keep co doing what we, you are doing. But I felt that the the, the reactions of. Uh, youngsters and uh, just women of color, my friends who are not activists, who after six years told me we were never aware of the impact it had, thank you, was for me most important because um, I felt that the activists were already aware of the impact that the far right have. Uh, but just a mother or a, a friend of me who is not focused on anti-racism, doesn't know nothing about it, was actually aware of the law system works for even for me, and that's uh, because of what she had did. Finally, it's actually weird that you had to pay over 8,000 euros as a victim, um, and then as the court fines include like 16,000. Was this paid to you or it was paid to the court? Like, what rewards uh, did you have? Because I mean, it's a lot of mental damage, physical damage, resources, and so on. Was there any specific reward for you personally? Yeah, um, so m with my lawyer, we decided to ask, uh, but I don't know the, f the, the English word, temporarily one euro. We did it strategically. T we used to, uh, a justice word uh, in the court's justice system. We used the word temporarily just to uh, make sure that the media will never use this against me. Eh? They will never use, she did it just to get money, but because it's, it, we used the word temporarily, the judge said you have uh, a, a still time to decide how much you want to uh, ask of money, of course. Um, and I'm still thinking about it. What is the emotional damage and which price can I t 
t take for it. Should I'm I suggest thinking, for you? So I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> you, can, you can demand for millions. If you don't need it, you can donate it to activism cause. Yeah, yeah, because the, and then the, you would be empowered to speak more, right? Yeah, because the fundraising money I got a lot more than the eight thousand, yeah. and um, we have like uh, an active uh, an organization, Justice Pour Mehdi, and that's an uh, an organization uh, when Mehdi is a young boy, Moroccan boy, who got killed by the police in Belgium, and his brother is doing a lot of important work, so. I made an arrangement with him uh, when your lawsuit is all still also going on. I had the fundraising money, I will give it to other activists. Yeah, demand the money and distribute it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't, don't let it go, right? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Sorry to say, but the far right people usually they have a lot of money. <laughs> so um, we said it's your privilege. Use your privilege. Thank you so very much, Jihad. On that final note, uh, before you clap, let me just say thank you to her again. <laughs> So as we reflect on uh, Jihad's journey, let us um, recommit ourselves to the fight for digital landscape where justice prevails over hate, um, where empowerment trumpets over um, oppression. Let us as well stand um, shoulder to shoulder in defense of truth, integrity, and human dignity. Jihad, we are really or deeply grateful for your bravery for your unwavering commitment um, to justice, like you said, not for yourself, but for all of us in the next generation. Your story actually inspires um, all of us to strive for a world where no one is beyond control, where the power of information is harnessed for the greater good. Thank you for sharing your story with us and the world. I mean, for the first time, perhaps outside um, Belgium, um, may it serve as a beacon of hope for countless individuals, activists, and victims um, who actually continue to be confronted with scores of digital authoritarianism and oppressions. Finally, to all of us, let's actually continue our discussion, not just here, with renewed determination and, of course, purpose. Together, I believe we can all build a future where justice equality and empowerment reign supreme. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, really I want to thank you, Jihad, and also Nima for this great moderation. And uh, I really hope, Jihad, that this uh, will be a moment important for you as well, because I know that is the first time that you speak in English as a keynote in an event about your story to justice. So uh, I hope that this will bring you more and also to story of other people for justice. So thank you so much. And thank you for the moderation. And uh, now I just want to remind you that we have uh, a panel again in uh, uh, 25 minutes. So I ask everyone to come back uh, at 6.40. And uh, we will have a panel also to speak very important stories uh, in Ukraine, uh, Gaza, and Azerbaijan. So uh, please uh, come and uh, we will go on to speak us about justice in that context. Thank you. <laughs>